Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. This is episode number 94. And I've actually got an individual who was with us way back uh, about a year ago. We had this individual on, on episode number 38. And his name is Dr. Trent Grunmeyer. Dr. Grun- Trent Meyer. <laughs> Trent, Dr. Grunmeyer, welcome, man. Thanks for coming back today. No, excited uh, for the invitation, Jared, and always great to connect and and hopefully uh, leave some some nuggets for your listeners today. I really enjoy listening to the podcast myself. Well, hey, if you what I would recommend is this: is if you have not yet listened to episode thirty eight, I would you know you can check this out. I want you to listen to this episode for sure, but I also want you to go back to episode thirty eight because we are going to piggyback on a lot of the ideas we talked about on that episode, specifically when it comes to some interview ideas, uh, getting your foot in the door, and the principalship and the superintendency. Um, Trent is. Um, he's got a, he wears many hats, literally wears many hats. Um, so two major things that I, that he, he does are one, he is associate professor of educational leadership at Drake university. And second, he is the founder, the CEO of Grunmeyer leader services, which is a school leadership search firm. And they are exploding. I talked before the show with Trent, like exponential growth right now with his with his search firm. Trent, how many searches are you doing right now? I care. And I know it's in flux a little bit, but where are you at right now? I think we have uh, 10 or 11 posted uh, right now, but I just want to add, it's, it's certainly not just me anymore. I got a, a pretty good team of uh, other consultants that uh, support me and, and do a lot of the work. So I appreciate the kind words and we're going to continue to serve the field well, but uh, we'll let our reputation and our work do the talking, but I think we have about uh, 10 going right now. So 10 searches, guys. I mean, if you look at, and, and I know this is, mo- Trent has, uh, they've done some things, not, not only in Iowa, but really in the Midwest or starting to get outside the state of Iowa. But I mean, if you're looking at any of the major superintendency openings right now in Iowa, I mean, he he's the guy, uh, he, him and his group there, they've got a They've got a great, um, just, they got a great system going right now and they, and they've really earned the respect of a lot of districts in the state. So if you are currently an aspiring leader, maybe you have a goal of one day being a superintendent and we're going to talk a little bit about principal ideas too, but you're going to come away with so much knowledge, so much, um, helpful information. That's really going to help you make this jump. So this is going to be a great episode. I can't wait. Um, but Trent, before we jump into like, we're going to ask you a lot of questions about the search process, about, um, gosh, we got so many cool topics to talk about. Before we do that, why don't you just share a little bit, for those of us who haven't listened to episode 38, why don't you just share a little bit about your educational experience, your leadership background, and how you got to doing what you're doing right now? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I'll be brief, but um, actually I was a, I'm a recovering high school principal uh, and still miss my high school principal days because I really enjoyed being part of uh, the student experience and, and working with staff and, and everything else in a, in a high school climate. But uh, I got my PhD at, at Iowa State. And uh, when Drake uh, kind of uh, reached out to me, I just thought this was a, a fork in the road, if you will, about getting into higher education long term or uh, staying in the K-12 field. And um, after, after some interviews and, and talking to my family, uh, I felt like this uh, fork in the road getting into higher ed was, was the right move at the time with a young family and, and certainly no regrets there. Uh, but I also knew uh, I am not like uh, the traditional uh, higher ed faculty that is collecting perhaps uh, IPERS or retirement of some sort. And uh, you know maybe uh, teaching for four or five years and then fully retiring. That is certainly uh, not my not my path. So I knew I had to stay uh, relevant in the field. So a lot of my research, matter of fact, uh, almost all of my research is in in the uh, K-12 uh, setting and things that I think will provide value to schools and school leaders. And quite honestly, Jared, um, I advise the superintendent program here at Drake University, take a lot of pride in that and used to have other search firms come in and talk to my students. And uh, I certainly won't say anything negative about any other firm. I, I just, I, I saw a opportunity to maybe innovate, uh, be a little more transparent and objective in the hiring process. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Jay Mathis, who was the superintendent, and I'll be forever grateful for, uh, at Eldora New Providence, gave me my start uh, for a, a, actually a high school principal hire. And uh, that one led to two. And then every year since then, we've not quite, but almost doubled uh, the amount of searches uh, that we've done uh, in Iowa 
and now just starting to get into Nebraska and Missouri. So long story short, that was kind of my path, still teaching and advising the superintendent program at Drake and continuing to grow uh, our search firm and, and trying to serve schools uh, through the leadership hiring, as well as administrative retreats we did this past summer. And we even do some hiring audits and some onboarding, um, but just really uh, where, where we can serve the field well um, is where we try to put our efforts. So yeah, thanks for asking. That was, that was really the path the last uh, eight or 10 years. So that was, uh, I, I mentioned the exponential growth and it truly was, you said you've pretty much doubled every, every year. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. We went from one to two. And then I think the next year was about eight. Uh, and then I think it was 12 or 13. And then I remember 21, 24 last year was 31. And I think this year we're, we're probably going to be on track to be, you know, 40, 40 plus. Wow. So, yeah. Managing that growth and, and keeping the reputation up. And, and, you know, I want every search, I want them to finish and, and not know how many searches I have going, just, you know, feeling like we're, we're giving sure. them the time and attention Absolutely. they deserve. Absolutely. So what do you, just, what do you think it is, you know, you've, uh, you mentioned, you know, you've had a chance prior to starting GLS, you had a chance to kind of see how other search firms worked. Um, what do you think it makes, makes, you know, doubling each year cannot be taken lightly. I mean, that's pretty impressive. You said four or 50 searches this year. What do you think it is about GLS that really um, maybe sets you apart from other search firms? Yeah, well, the first I'll, I'll tell you the first thing I tell a board almost every presentation is, you know, this works best. This meaning getting the right hire works best when when our team respects that 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 board knows their district and their community better than us. We acknowledge that. What we know is how to recruit and structure a hiring practice that's going to a hiring process, I should say, that's going to get the right person in the end. And when they trust us to do that part and we trust them to know uh, their district and community, that's when it works. Uh, that's when the process works. We and we respect each other's roles and we get there in the end. So, you know, that's the first is, is really our philosophy about the process. And in saying that, I th- you know, when I'm honest about it, I think the things that sets us apart are that honesty, uh, the transparency, just about process. For example, you know, in our process, uh, the board will see every single candidate, whether it's an athletic director, a superintendent, principal, any hire, they're going to see every candidate that applies when we're going to vet them the same. Uh, That doesn't mean that um, everybody's going to get the same attention as they move forward as semifinalists and finalists, but uh, we deserve if a candidate, uh, we believe if a candidate takes the time to apply, the board deserves to see them. Uh, And so, you know, just things like that, uh, the objective screening tools that I've partnered with continue to stay innovative on to to make the decision in the end, not just a, a heart decision about, I think this person is the right one for our community or our district, but also a head decision. I see the data. I know what I'm getting. I know how they're going to be outside of the formal interview process. Uh, I think really just confirms that the tools we're using process that we're leading is what people are looking for. And and certainly uh, keeping people um, uh, in their role longer, because that's, that's the other thing we, if we do a good job, then, then, then whatever roles should be there beating those, those national averages. When you think back, you mentioned your very first, um, very first opportunity was that Eldora New Providence High School hire, right? Mm-hmm. And now here you are, a hundred plus searches in, and you think specifically about your your philosophy behind like the interview, the process. What has like been the biggest change? Well, that's a that's a great question because uh, we've certainly evolved a lot of things. Um, I know I didn't give you this one ahead of time. I warned you. I was like, I might come up with some along the way here, so. <laughs> Yeah, interestingly enough, I, I would tell you there's a couple things. I don't know if I could just pencil it down to one. I, I will tell you on the board side, I would say over the years uh, on superintendent hires, I think boards have become more involved. Maybe not the full board, but there's always some board members that want to, to really be involved in the process, which is I don't think it's a bad thing, but I've seen that change over time. I would say how we're recruiting candidates has changed. You know, every uh, district seems to want, you know, diverse candidates. And I certainly understand that. Uh, But that's a challenge to make sure that you're trying to get the most diverse and deep candidate pool possible. So how we're recruiting them via social media uh, and some networking and and those tools uh, is critical. Trying to make personal connections with with folks that might be good has has changed and evolved. and then I would just say some of the things like our process, you know, I can, I could look you in the eyes and tell you, uh, I've lost four um, 
top candidates for, for a board, superintendent candidates in, in eight years. And every one of those was not comfortable because I want that board to get who they want in the end, unless something came up where it you know, just wasn't going to work uh, based on some formal interviews. And two of those, Jared, were, were uh, money. Uh, they just couldn't come to terms on money. And, and normally there was a strong second candidate, right? Because maybe they could have come to terms, but there was a number two that they were content with. And the other two were a spouse. And that's interesting because the candidate in both cases, I think, thought their spouse was on board ah. until they got the offer. <laughs> oh, gosh, for sure. For sure. So we've taken, uh, you know, the money thing kind of off the table and, and what we call a pre-negotiations document where we we, we flip it and, and, and ask the, this, the finalists, you know, what would it take to accept the job if, if you get mm. the offer? And, and they let us know. Um, and if it's reasonable, I, I try to get them uh, what they, they're asking for. And I certainly know if they need insurance or a tax shelter annuity or a multi-year contract going into the formal interview. So that, that's really taking the money off the table and help that conversation. And then the spouse thing is we just try to cater to spouses and families uh, for the finalists so that they are part of the process and feel comfortable if their spouse gets the offer. So that's evolved too. Um, and knock on wood, but uh, so far in the last uh, four to six months, we, we haven't lost any top candidates. And then that's the goal. Okay. okay. You got me really, I'm going to go another question off the top of my head here, but this pre-negotiations document has got me very interested. Um, from a candidate's perspective, you know, I know you work with the boards, uh, what, what advice would you give somebody who's on the other end? They know they're a finalist. Um, any advice you can give somebody who gets that pre-negotiations document and they're suddenly asked, okay, what do you think would be, a, what would you come for? Like any advice? And again, I know this is such a tough question. I'm just throwing it at you, but what advice would you have for the candidate who has that? Okay. I'm a finalist. What do I tell this? What do I tell this board? Yeah, no, that's that's a fair question, and I, I think I have a, a fairly straightforward answer for you. For for the, the the candidates in our process, and I can't speak to all, but in our process, Jared, they would know what the salary range was uh, at the onset. It's going to be clarified at, when they became a semifinalist and then uh, as a finalist, as well as the benefit package. And oftentimes, I even share with them the outgoing uh, superintendent's contract, so they see the terms of the contract as well. So. When I ask them to, you know, what what they would need, they know what that range is, and, and and normally differentiate what they're asking for based on experience and what they're currently making, and and it just forces the conversation before the end of the day, so um, it's not awkward for them, and so I can advocate them, and so the board can land who they want. So because we've been transparent in the process up to that point, it's really not a, a got go you seek all this comparative data. Um, we've really shared a lot of that with them throughout the process. Okay. Okay. Hey, you mentioned just the, the track record in, te in terms of the low um, superintendent turnover. Like you, yeah, um, I know you, that's been one of your biggest things about finding the right fit. Um, yep. Why have you guys been so successful in keeping your superintendents in place? Because we know that turnover nationwide on superintendents is, is a pretty high or it's not very many years. Uh, but what, how, and maybe you can give us that data. It looked like you're going to give me yep. a number there. So uh, why have you guys been able to buck the trend and get superintendents to stay uh, where you hired them at? Yeah, that's a great question. First, the, the Wallace research that came out in February uh, is that the, the national uh, tenure on secondary principals and superintendents uh, is, is four years or just under four years. So that's, that's pretty relevant uh, statistics and what we're certainly trying to beat for the sake of student achievement and, and school culture. But, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I, I think it just comes down to transparency to candidates and objectivity and process. You know, it should not be a surprise. And so we just try to front load everything. I tell boards, you know, you should know when you're looking across the table who the right candidate is based on what you said you wanted when we started this process uh, before you knew any of the candidates. And so objectifying what is truly going to move a district forward and how someone's going to fit in the district and the community, by the way, uh, is, is, is what's going to keep them there long term. And, and not to deviate too far, but um, I know one of the things that, that we may talk about is, is the retention of uh, superintendents and principals, and, and which is a passion of mine, 
uh, one of my first years at Drake, um, I actually did a study of Iowa secondary principals. Um, and I think it's very relevant to superintendents as well. Um, but it was right here in Iowa. And, and I asked, you know, what, what's the current satisfaction levels? Um, what factors will you consider in, in leaving and or staying in your current uh, district? And I anticipated that salary and benefits would probably be at the top of the, the priority list. And I was very surprised, Jared, and I think it's more relevant uh, for, for millennials that are getting into education and just post-COVID people balancing, you know, their personal professional lives. But, but here's what I found, and, and it stuck with me. The number one factor for, for secondary principals was the support and contentment of their family. Mm -hmm. if, if mama's happy in town, dad's mm -hmm. connected in town, kids are connected with friends, they mm -hmm. are more apt to stay in that job and that community. And I, I think that's even uh, mm -hmm. uh, been uh, secured, if you will, uh, after the pandemic. Uh, yeah. At least it's been harder to recruit people away uh, with that loyalty. So that was the number one factor that came out of that survey. Number two uh, was clear expectations from uh, the, the superintendent and or central office staff and school board. So, you know, some of the folks talked about, hey, I'll look if, if I'm not connecting with the superintendent. I feel like they don't have clear directives. Um, you know, if there's confusion, chaos, they don't feel supported. That was the number two factor. And then number three, uh, as anticipated, was salary and benefits. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's part of fit as well. And I think that's part of retention. And, um, and that was relevant, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I published it. And I, th I think it's probably even more uh, relevant uh, today for superintendents and principals. Completely agree with everything you've said. And like you said, you, you, that was a study you did six, seven years ago. I think it's even more and more uh, true now with COVID. And like you said, as more and more younger millennials enter the profession, that's what's important to them is how well does my family like it here? How, how well do I get along with the board, which is huge for superintendents? How long do I get along with my, how well do I get along with my superintendent? That yep. autonomy, I've written about that before. Like how much trust do I have? Do I feel, do I like coming to work every day? Uh, so I completely agree with what you're saying. So my next question was about retaining principles. Anything else you want to talk about in terms of, I mean, you've done some really cool research. You've, you've done some graphics uh, about just keeping principles so, uh, or administrators or, or whatever. Any other thing, anything else you want to add there? No, I just, you know, I do reflect a little bit because I was a, a secondary principal and, you know, there's days I miss it. I, I really enjoyed it, but I'll just tell a quick story. I, I um, you know, I felt like I was a, a pretty good high school principal and gave a lot of time, but I also had a young family. And what tugged on me most was, was, you know, when you're at home, you, your mind was still at work. And when you're at work, you know, you felt like you, you know, should be at home or were feeling guilty for not being there. The, the, the straw that kind of broke the camel's back for me was a, a, a heck of a crazy busy week. Friday night uh, basketball game, hadn't seen my two girls at that time most of the week, so I brought them with because they like to dance with the cheerleaders and all that. And wouldn't you know, the fire alarm goes off mid-game. So here I am passing my girls off to a couple high school kids that I didn't know very well. I'm going to shut the fire alarm off. And oh yeah, I got an offer earlier that week to go to Drake and not deal with the nonsense anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was kind of a timely or pivotal, yes. uh, you know, for me. And I, I just struggled with, you know, I, I think the time it takes to be a good principal and the time it takes to be a good parent was really at odds. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not honestly sure to this day, if you can truly be, I, I think you can do both and be good. I'm not sure you can, you can do both and be great if I'm honest. And I just struggled with that uh, being, being a parent, the time it takes and being a secondary principal or, or principal at all superintendent too, for that matter. So that was, that was my personal struggle. Uh, but I continue to see research on engagement um, and, and people want to work for people they value and, and a mission they value. And so if there's anything else I would add, I would just say, you know, fostering a team of people that are unified, uh, supporting each other through the ups and downs because they're going to be there. Uh, is, is perhaps what's going to keep people uh, there above and beyond, you know, salary, which you might think first. So we've talked about some ideas with superintendents, some ideas with principals. One thing that I want to talk to you about was the teacher shortage. 
Um, and, and any advice you've got for us, and I know you've got some ideas because I've seen some of the graphics and some of the things that you and, and your, you know, your, your business have pumped out there, but what advice do you have about recruiting and retaining educators? Yeah. And that's going to be huge. I, I, I put something on Twitter the other day and I said, this problem is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and I hope uh, that educators, me included, we don't wait for legislation or policy to uh, to go into effect to change this because uh, a I don't have a ton of hope that that will happen anytime soon, and b we just we just can't wait. I, I think we have the answers. Uh, so I, I threw out. Um, I worked with Carroll Schools and some other schools on this topic, um, and, so, and it's a, one of passion. I, I threw out on social media. You know, what are schools doing um, to, to recruit and, and just wanted to find some innovative ideas. And I'll share this if folks want it. Uh, and then I had kind of some buckets that I heard feedback on. And I, I just share a couple strategies. Uh, and, and I would also say, and this isn't a shameless plug necessarily, but I really like your blog about um, hiring and, and marketing. And I see what you how you market some of your positions as well as, as a good practice. But in, in your, your blog, you talk about posting early. I would agree. The sooner you can anticipate openings, post them. I'm seeing more and more districts actually, actually offer incentives uh, to teachers around early retirement and for leadership positions around early retirement, just so they can get ahead of uh, a strong uh, candidate pool. The other thing I would tell you is, and you get this, um, but, but how you uh, just post a job, you know, the graphics, the infographic about your stats, uh, how engaged your staff tend to be, uh, your retention, uh, just things that showcase pride and separate your district from the next one actually catch the eyes of, of young staff and others that are looking. So I think that's a great strategy. And I know you, you shared that as well. Uh, and then I think the other thing is that I mentioned is, is get creative about where you post. You know, I know in Iowa, it's Teach Iowa and Nebraska has a national or a state posting board. A lot of states do. But that's not the only place people are looking. So social media is great because you, you get people that are following or networked with you. We found LinkedIn. Um, you, can, you can get folks, and it might not be the person directly, but all of a sudden they're sharing it with a family member who wants to move back to Iowa uh, or wherever. So I think that's, that's valuable. So just getting creative about that uh, as well. Uh, I really align to what you, you shared. Let me throw out a couple other ideas uh, as well. Um, uh, one that I learned was working with local community colleges and colleges around the pipeline. So not just recruiting new, but I know William Penn, a good friend there, Shane Ayersman, who's who's got a program and others where they're they're going to support staff that maybe had no aspirations of being a teacher, but now they're in a school system. They like the schedule. They like the kiddos uh, helping to either pay for uh, or, or encourage them to go and, and get a, a, a teaching degree. Um, as a support staff member and just great stories of, you know, associates that became teachers and, and, and moved up some even becoming principals and superintendents. So I think that's an innovative idea. Um, other ones um, given stipends for relocation costs. We know that for superintendents and principals that that's, I'm not going to say it's a norm, but it, it happens frequently. You know, what about doing that for, and it doesn't have to be a ton, you know, maybe it's $500 and the football team will help unload the truck when you get here. <laughs> um, but it's something the next district isn't do uh, isn't yes. is, is doing. So I think putting yes. something like that out there was was uh, innovative. Um, I've seen signing contracts, which I think you've you've also done, uh, or even money towards uh, student loans. I've also seen more recently where they're willing to pay for a professional membership, uh, which is innovative. And you know, at the university here, we get you know we get some memberships paid to stay current and, and be an expert in our field. Well, somebody that's hired as a as a, a, a social studies teacher, they may want to stay current as well and stay connected to a, a national association or a local. So, you know, maybe paying a, a cheap $50, $100 membership uh, could be huge uh, to attract folks. Uh, other ideas, I, I don't want to ramble here, but I think some of these are, are pretty good. You know, activity passes, you know, you want your staff to get to events and games, but if you can take away a barrier on that, how about giving activity passes so they can bring their family Instead of going to a movies Friday night, they might come to a ball game or a concert more often. I think that's a fantastic idea and doesn't cost uh, a whole lot uh, at the gate. I've even seen some go above and beyond that where they do memberships at a local swimming pool to promote family and wellness, golf course, 
Uh, and on another district I learned was, was doing booster club membership to get them engaged in, in the booster club. I thought all of those were, were fairly uh, innovative. And then just lastly, I just, just uh, one other one I wanna mention, uh, because I said this before, you know, spouses that are, are moving with uh, their spouse to a new job often have some anxiety and are leaving uh, often a good job and a network behind. So I don't think we can minimize um, uh, some of the, the, the intentional things that you can do to get that spouse included into a community, and that will help with retention as well. So helping to connect them with business leaders, with the chamber, uh, even giving them, you know, a shirt or, or things with your logo and your school so they feel part of the community and getting them connected with the PTOs and people in town so they're connected right away, I, th I think is huge. And we'll give the candidate um, some peace of mind that their family is going to be engaged and included uh, right away. So again, I don't want to ramble, but I think there's good incentives. And if folks reach out, I'll make sure they have uh, some of this list uh, that, that I pulled together as well. So many cool ideas there. And you're right. I, I, uh, Trent gave me the, uh, gave me a, a graphic ahead of time where there's probably gosh, 25 ideas on there. And I feel like here we're, we're pretty cutting edge. There's some really, really cool ideas on there. Um, that, you know, I love what you said. It's something that the other district doesn't do. I mean, they might not be, these are not huge. Um, these are not huge. Well, they're not huge amounts of money, but they're the little things that matter. And, you know, usually I feel like here, at least we've had a pretty good, um, we've done pretty good about closing on employees this year. We lost quite a few to some bigger mm -hmm. districts, um, that we were our, our top choice. You talked about not losing your top choice. Like we've lost our top choice a few times to the bigger districts around us. Um, and I wonder if we had just done a couple little smaller things, um, what, how, if, if that would have made the difference quite honestly. So I love that graphic. However, we can get that graphic out there. Let's get it out there because it is really, I haven't seen anything quite like this with all these unique ideas. Um, so kind of thanks for covering those things. I liked them. I, 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 all the things you talked about are so cool and it's cool that you heard, you know, you heard the best of ideas from different districts. You threw it out there and that you kind of, kind of got those collected. So very, very cool, man. Yeah, I can't take take much credit for any of those on my own, Jared. I, but I will. Uh, I'll actually get it out there in social media so people can see that, and then just invite them to be in touch if they if they want to learn more. But uh, we got to work together to get folks in this profession. Uh, our our uh, our, we're, our country's counting on it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, we're gonna go back to superintendents for a minute. What are some? And you did a really cool. Uh, it looks like a, like a white paper, I think is what you call it, um, on uh, transitions for superintendents, because you talk about that. If you get off to a great start, man, you know, it, it, it just makes a world of difference. You talked about that, that four-year window. Um, so maybe just talk about what are some keys to a smooth transition for superintendents? Yeah. Um, just so you know, the white papers there that we produce every year, uh, my team and I at GLS try to add something to the field, either for candidates, for school boards, for districts that will be valuable uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in producing and in publishing. So that, it, as you said, we have a white paper out there, it's on the website, um, and it's about uh, transitions, successful superintendent transitions. I think there's insights for, for any position into that. And what we did is we tracked, I, I believe it was seven of our superintendent transitions. So both the outgoing superintendent uh, that were all retiring, I believe, or leaving to a new district. So all leaving in, in pretty good terms, to be honest. And then those new superintendents that got hired. And by the way, some of those got hired in January and some May. So the transition time was different, but it was very consistent in what we found. And I think this will be valuable for folks as they think about spring transitions. First of all, be very clear. Uh, I would challenge the, the outgoing superintendent or board president to get four people in the room. Outgoing superintendent, new superintendent, board president, business manager, and say, how are we going to transition? Literally that. Mm -hmm. Because if that does not happen, somebody feels like their toes are getting stepped on. And I could give you examples, but uh, you know, the outgoing superintendent that's put their heart and soul in the district doesn't want to feel like that new person is stepping on their toes. The new person doesn't want to necessarily step on their toes. The board doesn't sometimes know whether to get the outgoing 
uh, the new person whose feedback on important decisions, especially policy, new hire, some of those things. So I think just hit it on the head, have the conversation. How are we going to include each other for what decisions? So everybody's on the same page. That's probably my best advice in transition. Wow. Um, and, and again, somebody has got to take the bull by the horns there and just, just have a, a 10 minute conversation. That's really uh, all it takes. The other pieces that we found was uh, having the new superintendent get to the district during um, normal, whatever normal looks like these days, uh, normal operations where they can be visible, they can walk around, the optics of that, the chance to meet people and build relationships just helps in ensure a smooth district. And I know that's a challenge for new superintendents because they're, they might be finishing another job and, and then, uh, you know, a, with a foot in both uh, trenches, but, but that was uh, deemed really important from from the folks we talked about being visible getting to the district in normal operations i think the other thing we found in that was having an intentional entry plan some folks share that as part of the hiring process and then we're able to give that to the board and say here's my plan i'm going to listen for the first three months you know here's the listening tour here's the questions i'm going to tend to ask and then i'm going to come back to you board and let you know what i found out and what my next steps are uh, it almost gives that new superintendent that new principal permission to listen and learn for a while before they're asked to, you know, make big decisions. And, and again, that can change. I mean, if you were a superintendent for the first time and COVID hit, right, you're, it, it, there's not a whole lot of time to look and listen. It's, we, we got to move and, and uh, get things going, but, but that having a plan and being intentional about it and asking the board to uh, allow you to work your plan, I think is, is clearly a best practice. And then uh, the success I see from superintendents long-term uh, is, is really a, a stool. The, the board president, the school business official or board secretary, and that superintendent. If you lose one of those legs of that stool, you will see even long-standing superintendents um, lose credibility and sometimes you have to update the resume and leave. So I would just say foster the relationship from day one with those critical people, business manager, board president, superintendent. Now, not saying others, admin team. Uh, I'm not saying that others are not important. I'm just saying when you're setting the board agenda, uh, you're getting pushback from the community. People question budget. Though All of those things, you three that are at the board table have to be uh, respectful and on the same page. And if not, I've just seen where even, even a board president turns over and all of a sudden the support that the superintendent had for the last six years, all of a sudden it starts to wane. Mm -hmm. So for superintendents that are that have new boards, that have challenges they don't even know about yet, I would say never take for granted the support you have from those people and continue to foster those relationships. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask you another question here. I'm trying to frame it here because you're so right. I, superintendents and district leaders have been going through a lot of political issues <laughs> where they're getting pulled in both directions, uh, whether it's masks, vaccines, uh, just all kinds of things. Is there any, and again, I don't know if I have a perfect question for you, but what have you seen? Because you get to see all these superintendents in action. You get to see the ones who are leaving, the ones who are coming in. What are, what, what are the people who are able to navigate these choppy waters politically? What are they doing or maybe some of the other superintendents who are getting themselves into trouble. What are they? What is the difference? Can you help me out? What are you seeing out there in the field? Yeah, I don't know if I see a difference, but because um, some superintendents had relationships built with people way before these issues happened. But I will say, Jared, honestly, I think the pandemic and some of these issues have have reconfirmed uh, the relationships between boards and superintendents and administrative teams, or split them. It's just made the issues more glaring or it's made them more unified. And that's been pretty black and white, uh, which is probably part of the reason I'm so darn busy again this year. <laughs> <laughs> it but, does uh, seem like just, just from afar, cause I don't, you know, get into in the weeds with us, uh, so, but it seems like the political stuff has really um, created some, you know, some of the transitions that we're seeing uh, not only in our state, but across the country, quite honestly. So, um, Hey, you host something called applicant insights workshops. I think you mentioned this earlier. What can you tell us about these events? Yeah, I'm really excited about them. Uh, we started doing these about three years ago. Uh, I would just tell you, I tracked the, the feedback on these and and uh, 72, uh, after last year, 72% of the people that attend one of these actually get a job advancement that they're looking for. 
So that's either assistant principal to a principal, principal to superintendent or superintendent, another superintendent job thereafter. And that's, I can't take any credit for that. Um, but our seminars are designed to give people insights to the hiring process, especially those that we lead, but the hiring process in general, help them really polish their application materials so they get the opportunity for interviews. Because if you don't get the paper, pass the paper tests and get seen, you're not gonna make it to those interviews. Uh, and then uh, we do mock interviews with some of the most popular questions they're gonna be asked. So hopefully build their confidence uh, in screening and formal interviews. So we feel like what we put together has been good for applicants. At least the data suggests that and some testimonials uh, every time we tweak it a little bit, but offering one um, here and I got a, a sponsor, DeNovo is actually sponsoring those for us now uh, and giving some resources to, to folks and, and even providing lunch. So that's been fun. We have one at Drake uh, or via Zoom, they're hybrid, on December 3rd. And then we're offering another one on Saturday, January 29th. And uh, I guess I'll share this now, Jared. Um, we're offering our first one um, nationally, uh, either in Savannah, Georgia or Hilton Head, July 20th and 21st, I believe. And we have to have 35 folks to, to make it go and financially, but uh, we're really excited. And we'll see if there's a national audience that wants to enjoy some sun and, and update their materials and get ready for next year as well. You have me at Hilton Head, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're excited about it. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not afraid to take that risk because I know it'll be valuable. We'll just see if there's interest there. But And I wasn't prepared. I wasn't planning on sharing that, but uh, but we are. We are. So, okay. And so what the, so I'm like, I'm at your website right now. The cost for somebody to attend, is it, is it 150? It's 150 for the two we're doing on the third and the, uh, uh, the 29th. Sure. The one in Hilton Head, I think is 350, um, for the, the two day workshop. So it's two days, even, even more. And then there's some, some other things that are optional, um, there. So trying to keep costs down, but, uh, hopefully really valuable. But just like any investment in yourself, if you're saying 72% of the people who attended got that advancement, got that next um, step up in leader, it paid for itself in the first five hours you work in that new job, it's already paid for itself, if, if that, you know? So I, in my I mind, so. that is such a small investment for something that is so powerful. So, um, cause a lot of people, you know, I get a lot of people who ask me, Hey, what can I do? Uh, you know, some tips, uh, for, for interviews, how do I get my foot in the door? I'm going to start, I'm going to tell them, Hey, check out this applicants insight seminar, man. That's awesome. You got, like you said, December 3rd, January 29th. Uh, and you said that's really for all levels. Um, you, you mentioned for maybe getting your foot in that door for assistant principal, all the way up to the superintendency. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. I think there's good insights to, to, to any of those. Matter of fact, I think even, you know, instructional coaches um, or, or others. I, I think that people would take quite a bit away because it's their resume, it's their cover letter, it's their uh, mock interview that we tailor to. So um, again, don't take it from me. Check, check out the testimonials. Talk to people that have been here. But I do feel like every time we offer it, we, we keep ramping things up and people leave um, both prepared and also more confident. Okay, Trent, what's that? One more question about interviews here. Um, you have seen hundreds of interviews. I want your three biggest tips for school leaders, your three biggest interview tips. Yeah, I was thrilled um, that you gave me a little time to think about this because I <laughs> probably have 10, but to narrow it down to three, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the nuggets here uh, as of today, because a year from now, maybe this will change. But honestly, here's, here's three, and I'm going to be direct and honest with these. Uh, number one, and this comes down to cover letters as well. I see so many candidates and you have to have broad experience and skills to be a school leader, no doubt about it. But you also really need to refine and get honest about your strengths. What sets you apart as a school leader uh, or a district leader than the next person? And I'm not sure people always are honest about what their strengths and experiences are. So I would just tell people, number one, get honest with yourself about what your, your strengths are that separate you from the next person. Okay. And, and, and is that's that, is that on the, is that on the, on the resume where you're writing that uh, in the cover letter, or is it more up here for when you're in that room? I would challenge you to put it in the cover letter and make it clear in your interviews. Okay. I will, I will tell you the last, one of my favorite last questions on a screening or formal interview is as we draw this interview to a close, what, what one or two things do you want us to remember about you as a candidate or another one? 
uh, what two to three things do you think separate you from the other candidates, right? That forces a candidate to say, here's what I want you to know about me that might be different and unique. Okay. And again, I would see that coming out in the cover letter more than the resume, uh, but it should also move you forward uh, in, in, uh, in a screening process. And if you're not sure about that, my, my little uh, activity is to take your resume, if it's updated, to three people you don't know very well or five people you don't know are very well and say, based on the details of my resume, what do you think sticks out uh, on my resume to you? And see what commonalities they come up with, right? They may say, well, this is a very unique experience or wow, here's a skill set that, you know, I don't see in a lot of resumes. Then make sure those uh, are highlighted in the cover letter rather than regurgitating a cover letter. Okay, love so it, that's tip, it. tip number one. Tip number two is this. Um, I just have to laugh here a little bit. I believe first impressions, uh, I know first impressions are critical, but the first interview question that you're asked, I consider a softball. Tell us about you know, why you're interested in this position. Um, we've seen your resume, what else would you like to share, right? It's a softball question and everybody around the table are making judgments and first impressions about you, okay? That is, and I know you might be a little bit nervous, but you should have thought about that answer I got to laugh, Jared, because as I sit in interviews, I hear even superintendents say, well, there's a golf course around here that we really like to play. And it turns half of the people off, right? Because it's not about them um, and it's not about the job or just other answers that you're going, ah, ah. And then they're trying to recover from the whole interview. Mm -hmm. And so I just think uh, another insight would be really think about, don't memorize, but have a couple points that you want to you emphasize in a clear and concise and genuine answer to a first, what I would consider softball question. Okay, Love that's that. point number two. Love that, yep. And number three, we can talk about applicant insights. I can give you all the, the polish I can to prepare for interviews. You can have the perfect answers and give 35 examples <laughs> uh, or whatever in an interview. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it comes down to a human connection. It comes down to a human connection between the people you're interviewing with and, and you. And I, honestly, um, I, the last point I would make, uh, since you limited me to three, is don't forget the human connection. Be prepared, share that you've done your homework, share interest in the job, give the examples, but don't forget making connections with the people around the table, convincing that you're, you wanna wear their colors and be part of their district and community. That's more important than one single interview answer. Mm -hmm. uh, any, um, I was going to, the, the human connection, what, what is, and I think I, I know exactly what you're saying, but is there something you can remember from an interview that you saw that you're like, wow, that was impactful the way they did this What the, how can you remember somebody who really connected with, uh, with the group and how they did that? Oh yeah. Um, first of all, I can't, this isn't one example, but just getting people to laugh and, and be yourself. Uh, there's candidates that get nervous and they, they almost joke around about being nervous on this or, or, you know, being in the other side of an interview and just getting them to joke uh, lets people know that they're human. Uh, I saw another candidate that actually brought a picture of their family and said, you know, not just me, but my family is interested in this district and this community and, and committed to them. That was powerful. Uh, others that um, actually did their homework, uh, especially with the board and, and knew something about the school board members personally and came in and said, oh, you're the one who's also a fireman. Uh, you're the one that has military experience. Thank you for your service. I mean, wow, that's a human connection. Okay. Love it, love it. Dude, I, I, I encourage people who are listening to this, like this is such good stuff. You're hearing it from somebody who is in high stakes interviews all the time that I mean, you're seeing, you've got, you, you've been in some, you know, <laughs> they're all high stakes interviews, but I mean, these are the best of the best that you're bringing to these interviews for these finalists. And this is who the, the best people out there who are competing for these high profile jobs are doing these things. So I encourage you to not only listen to what Trent is saying, but also to um, add these to your, um, your mindset when you're approaching, getting ready for these interviews. This is, this is really, really good, man. Anything else you want to add in terms of interviews um, that we, 
I mean, you said you had 10 items. I guess, do you want to give us one more? Because those three were really good. How about one more uh, tip that you would you would pass along? Sure. Yeah, and I hope what I'm sharing is I, I'm, I'm just being very honest and transparent. And, and again, since you gave me a little lead time, I, I really feel like I can bring, you know, the best to, to, to folks' attention. If I, if I picked another one, Jared, and, and maybe this will sound a little odd, but it's knowing your timeframes. Um, in a screening interview, that's fairly quickly. There's a lot of candidates that almost um, they either ramble or they don't respect uh, the time frame. But what happens is if you have nine questions you want to ask, say in you know, 30, 45 minutes, and you only get through six, then you have a board member or hiring team that didn't get to three or four questions that they really wanted answers to. And so I would just say, so even though you feel like you might be pinching some of your answers, have a short answer on some questions so you can have a longer answer on others. But you really need to respect and prepare for those timeframes and screening and formal interviews so that you can get to those hot button questions uh, with from all the people uh, on the interview team. I, I so think true. that's my fourth point. So true, man. Uh, OK, gosh, we're getting down here. And I, and I know you've got to get to a commitment. He's, you're working with the board tonight, so I want to make sure we get you on the road. Um, any are there one or two um, searches you're doing right now that you want to highlight we, while we've got the audience listening to you here? Oh, well, I don't want to pick uh, some over the years <laughs> because they all deserve great leaders. And, and certainly <laughs> pick them. But um, I would just say, you know, our, we try to keep our website very current. And what I do for candidates is even if I don't have a ton of details about a job, you'll see out in social media and our, our GLS website, I'll put the, the job opportunity and the logo on there so that hopefully candidates have another couple of weeks to think about it before it's even live. So uh, SAI director uh, is a big one in our state because we all look to that person as, as a model and, and a support. So that's a big one. Uh, Waterloo is coming, which, you know, um, is a, a huge opportunity for somebody. Uh, talking to Burlington next week uh, and Earlham, um, Underwood tonight, um, Hampton Dumont. Uh, you can see the website. I don't want to miss any, but you know, all over the state, there's some great opportunities, and, and it really, uh, truly, Jared comes down to the right fit. Uh, and I'm happy to to follow up even after this podcast with people individually to help evaluate that. So I always try to make you know this this. Um, podcast is, has focused a lot on what's going on here in Iowa in the Midwest. Uh, but I always try to make it broad as national as possible. So just there's a lot of search firms out there. So, you, you know, you, you do a lot here in Iowa, but every state, every area has got their search firms. Um, what would you recommend candidates? Would you recommend they reach out to the search firm, introduce themselves? Like we never really know what to do, you know, with, with the, the, somebody in your position. Is that, is that a little too ambitious? Is that a little too aggressive? What do you recommend people who kind of want to start getting their foot in some of the bigger positions? What should they do? What interaction should they have with the search firm? Yeah, I think it could be one of two ways. I don't necessarily have a strong preference. Um, but I think, as I just talked to you about before, that human connection is important. So when I, when I get to know somebody and then see them on paper, or if I see them on paper and then get to know them throughout the interview process, uh, either, either way is fine to me. But certainly reaching out to search firms, getting them uh, a resume, cover letter, or just having a conversation, e even if you don't send them materials, I think is valuable just to build that connection. Um, but I would also, again, say, you know, just keep an eye on the job market, because if there's a job you, you want to go for, Perhaps you apply and then you reach out to the search firm and, and, and ask if there's questions and get to know them as well. So I don't think one has to happen before the other, but don't forget about the human connection with, with those folks leading the searches as well. So make sure I'm understanding this. The people in your position are not annoyed if candidates reach out to you and say, hey, just letting you know, I put it to, to give you the heads up that I'm going to apply for this or that I'm interested. That That is an okay thing to do. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, that, Hey, that's what we're in the business of doing, making connections. And I hope the folks that I've talked to, you know, would say, Hey, I'm almost, I'm always honest with them too. You know, somebody calls and says, is there a lot of experience in a pool? I'm going to say yes or no, uh, as they evaluate whether to take the time to, to even apply for a job. So, okay. Uh, but no, I, I would say make the connection. I, man, I, I agree. I was, I love that point. Cause you, sometimes you're wondering like, 
do I even have a chance? <laughs> you know, so I, for somebody who in your shoes is kind of say, if, you know, in a very tactful way, oh yeah, there's a lot of experience in this pool or, oh, you know, that, that, that would help out. Absolutely. So Trent, yep. man, we covered so much. Is there anything else you want to cover before we, uh, before we take off? No, I don't think so. I just, uh, I, I, I hope uh, what I've shared tonight is uh, valuable uh, to your listeners. Uh, I, I, I hope a uh, standing invitation to, to, to connect with us, uh, whether it's Twitter or the website or a personal call or email. I do, do really enjoy uh, getting to know people and, and making sure we get the right people and the right jobs. Uh, and I hope a year from now, Jared, we're talking about new opportunities and, and new supports and new ways of doing business and continue yeah. to grow and serve, serve the market. What well, does sound like you got you listed so full transparency here? I was hired uh, through GLS, and some of the things you listed, I don't remember at all. You know, I I definitely don't. You guys have evolved, is what I'm saying. That yep. I definitely don't remember the pre negotiations document. I don't remember a few of the other things you talked about. So, um, very very cool, man. Again, I don't know how you could not come away from this last 50, 55 minutes, like not feeling better prepared about the interview process for whatever leadership job you're you even mentioned instructional coaches. Like there's some things in there that if I'm going from the classroom to instructional coach, like using some of those first impressions matter, human connection, knowing your timeframes. Oh my God, Trent, you struck a chord with me when you talked about timeframes. Cause I've had, I've had an hour long interview that went 20 minutes that went an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy how not coherent people are with those time frames. So you kill, you did great, man. So many good things. Uh, again, this is Dr. Trent Gretmeyer. This is episode number 94, the group project podcast. Trent is associate professor at Drake university in the educational leadership department. He's also the founder of Gretmeyer leader services. Um, he's doing a number of searches. He's got to get on his way to Underwood, which is where on the Western part of the state. Is that correct? Yeah. Southwest over there. You bet. Southwest. So Trent, thank you so much. You've been a great, um, uh, per, per, uh, sponsor of the show. You, you and your team. I really appreciate it. And uh, just keep doing great work, man. You guys are really pushing education forward here in the Midwest. Well, thanks Jared. And, and for all the leaders out there listening, thank you for your service to schools. I know there's been challenges, but uh, I know we also have a couple holiday breaks coming up. So make sure you take care of yourself and your family and uh, get some downtime uh, with these opportunities as well. And I really mean that sincerely. All right, man. I'll get you on the road there. You have a good night. Okay. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much, Jared.